Uh, okay, so this is Drosophila melanogaster. Isn't he beautiful? I mean, okay, I mean, maybe it takes a, a mother's eye, a uh, mother's compound eye to see it, but this animal can do just amazing things. And to help get us started on, on why I think this animal is so amazing, um, I want to show you uh, a little demonstration that I think many of you have, have seen, but uh, I'll, uh, we'll do it anyway. So this is a, um, let's see here, for some reason that's not working. I think there's something that is off. So let me, let me pause, resume, and I want to do a, a simple control problem for you. I'm going to try to balance this meter stick on the tip of my finger. Now the idea is that the meter stick is going to rotate and my hand needs to adjust itself fast enough so that I can catch it before it falls. Now this is a problem that most of us can do. But once we start shortening the meter stick, like for example, if I tried to balance a pen on my finger, then we're already doing something that's pretty much impossible for most humans to do. And the reason is that the time that it takes for the pen to rotate shrinks with the size of the object. So by the time I get to something that's 10 times smaller than the meter stick, oops, yeah, this thing, it's just really hard to do. Itai, your microphone is still muted. Um, so we can't hear you at the moment. So the thing that's amazing <laughs> is that Flapping flight, insect flight, is subject to aerodynamic instabilities whose time scale is also set by the square root of the moment of inertia. And so the, by the length of the animal. And what's amazing is that a fly is only a millimeter tall. So it's performing this kind of balancing act with its own body, but now at a length scale and effectively a time scale that's about a hundred times faster than something that uh, is already impossible for, for most of us to do. Okay, and so that's the, the main thing that I want to tell you about today is um, how we're going about studying this amazing reflexive uh, action. And so the story starts with a brilliant experiment that my student Leif Ristroff uh, did uh, a few years back. And what he noticed was that if you take this brush from the Gordon Brush Company and you take a little clipping, you can glue that little clipping to, that, uh, to the back of the fly and it's, it's the fly is fine, it's still flapping its wings, no problem. But the thing that's nice about this clipping is it's magnetic. And so if we put a bunch of these flies into our arena where we record them from three different directions with fast cameras and then have a laser trigger so that when a fly comes in, the cameras start recording. But if we now include a pair of Helmholtz coils along with the recording cameras that are triggered by this laser, then as the fly is moving through the filming volume, we can give it a little tiny perturbation and get it to uh, uh, have a mechanical uh, displacement. And so this is what this looks like for a pitch perturbation. You see the pin on the back of the fly, that's this thing right here. These are three images from our fast video cameras. And we're reconstructing the full flight kinematics in the middle here on this model. And the Helmholtz coils in this case are top and bottom. And so when we activate the magnetic field, the pin wants to align with that magnetic field that pitches the animal up. And now the fly has to do something with its wings in order to correct. And very briefly, what it does is it changes how far forward it sweeps its wings before turning them back. And so if the fly pitches forward, then it sweeps the wings more to the front. That extra lift creates a torque that, that pitches it back. And if it pitches backwards, then it flips the wings less in the front. And so the torques from when the wings are in the back pitch it forward. And we can quantify that. That's what's shown in this plot. This is the angle, the front stroke angle, is a function of time. Here's uh, where the fly starts. We apply a perturbation in this yellow region here. And the fly is going to then pitch up. And so what it does is it changes this stroke angle 
so that it flaps more in the front by about 20 degrees. And then as time progresses, it gets back to its original uh, um, stroke angle. And the question that we want to ask is how is the fly determining this formula of where exactly to pitch its wings backwards um, at, at what time? And so I'm not going to take you through all the control theory uh, that Life and actually his brother uh, did to, to, to work this out. And then uh, later students like uh, Tsevi Batus, now who's at Hebrew U, and uh, Sam Whitehead, whose data I'm showing to you here. Um, but the basic idea is the following, that if I take a look at the uh, body of the fly itself, this is what the pitch velocity looks like. All right? And if I take the integral of that, that's this curve over here, this dashed. And this is really the total angular displacement, the integral of the pitch velocity that the fly has undergone. And what's amazing is that if I take these two curves and add them together with appropriate coefficients, I can generate this blue curve, which goes right through the data. And so what this says is that the fly, in order to figure out where to turn its wings back, it measures its own pitch velocity. It then integrates that to get the total angular displacement, so it knows calculus, and it sums the two curves together in order to generate this formula for where to pitch the wings back. And this can be summarized by uh, this very simple control theory model where you have a proportional term uh, that's proportional to the angular velocity and a integral term that's proportional to the total angular displacement with some delta t that's basically there to give you the time delay due to the neural processing that has to go on in the fly. And it turns out that this kind of control theory uh, uh, you know, uh, is, is sort of a standard controller. Uh, it's called a proportional integral. Sometimes you get a PID, proportional integral differential controller. It's the same controller that you might have in a sophisticated cruise control or a thermometer to set the temperature in the room. And it turns out that this formula also works when you roll the fly. So in this case, the pin is horizontal. We have the Helmholtz coils top and bottom. Here, the fly flaps harder with the wing that's at the bottom, that creates a torque that then rolls the fly back. Or in yaw, where the fly changes the pitch of the wing, and so it either slices through the air or smashes at the air and is able to create a yaw turn um, in order to correct the uh, perturbation. Um, so uh, this is the work that had been done uh, in my lab up until about 2015, so good uh, 10 years or so of work. Um, and the idea was that in all three cases, yaw, pitch, and roll, uh, you had a mechanism. Um, in the case of yaw, you're changing the wing pitch angle. In the case of uh, roll, you're changing the sweep angle difference between the left and right wing. And in the case of pitch, it's the how far you sweep into the front. And these were very fast response times of about uh, one to, to three wing beats uh, in order to get just, just to in, see the initial response. And since these animals are flapping at about 250 hertz, uh, you're basically looking at only a few neural firings that, uh, that you get before you have to respond. Okay, so it's a very fast control circuit. Um, okay, this is how the control theory people look at these circuits. So the idea is that you have some external torque uh, that is then applied to the fly. Um, the fly has uh, gyroscopic sensors on its body. They're called haltiers. We'll talk about them more. Uh, they're basically remnants of the third and fourth wings on, on Diptera. And these haltiers then through some neural circuit uh, essentially uh, send signals to the wings, either an integral part, which gives you the total angular displacement, or a proportional part, which gives you the uh, velocity. Um, uh, and that, that then goes to the uh, steering muscles that then change the wing stroke, which then also give a corrective perturbation, which then gets applied to the fly and so on. All right, so that's the control theory model that, uh, that we developed for this. And I just wanna uh, stop and see if there are any clarifying questions that I need to answer. So I think there is one clarifying question from Eric Dufresne, and he's asking, do you know what the fly measures, angular velocity or angle? 
Yeah, so uh, it's, it's not completely clear, but it's, um, people think that they measure the angular velocity and they think the way that that works is that you have these haltiers that are flapping back and forth on the back of the fly. And as the fly rotates, uh, you basically get a Coriolis force which uh, torques them. And the reason I say it's not exactly clear is that we actually don't know if the flies are measuring not only the angular velocity, but also the integral of that through some uh, placement of the sensors on the whole tier. And so that remains an open question exactly what it is that the flies are able to measure with this vibratory, vibratory gyroscope. Great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I know what you're thinking um, is, uh, you know, this is a beautiful picture. Uh, great that you, you spend so much uh, student time doing this work, but you know, how close really are these mechanical perturbations to, to what happens in nature? I mean, you know, it's a pretty contrived environment, Helmholtz coils, a pin, yada, yada. So, um, so I wanna answer the question, um, uh, is eliciting a fast control response biologically relevant? And I wanna answer that question by showing you this video. So I, I know what you're thinking, uh, upstate New York, we love our guns, uh, but hold, bear with me. So, so did, did you see it? Okay, uh, from the, the stunned faces that, that I can't see. Uh, play okay. one more time maybe. maybe. One more time, I'm gonna play for you one more time. But what I want you to notice is that um, right near the donut, there's actually a fly. Okay, so uh, there's the fly, and you can see that as the bullet goes, it experiences a roll perturbation, and then does those wing corrections, just like our experiments. And so I think the answer is unequivocally yes, that these kinds of roll perturbations happen all the time in nature, at least in upstate New York, uh, and that these flies have to correct for these perturbations in these very extreme maneuvers. Okay, now um, I said that the fly does this through a set of vibratory gyroscopes on its back. And this is the video that sort of explains uh, how, how, how we know that. So um, like I said, flight is unstable to these kinds of perturbations anyway. And the insects are constantly needing to correct these torques. And so here's a movie of uh, an insect taking off and, and flying no problem. But I, I hope you can see that, that something is very strange with this movie which is that these, these flies um, have been decapitated and then their necks have been cauterized. And the way that we make them take off is by raising the temperature. So this is another reflex action. You raise the temperature, they tend to wanna to go away from that surface. And these flies can fly no problem, even though they have no head. In the words of, of Jim Truman, whose videos uh, these are, uh, the head is overrated. Uh, no, so what's happening is that the fly uh, is able to stabilize its flight with a pair of gyroscopic organs called the haltier. So that's what uh, I'm pointing to with my mouse here. Maybe I'll uh, go back to the laser pointer. Uh, this little thing right here. And uh, if you take uh, a video of them, uh, this is from the Fox Lab, you can see these uh, haltiers flapping basically at the same frequency as the uh, two wings. And that's like I said, because the remnants of the third and fourth wings that all diptera used to have. In fact, the haltiers have uh, the same kinds of steering muscles that are in the wings. Um, and the idea then is that if you take a look at the back of the fly, what happens is that there are neurons that connect the sensors at the base of the haltiers. Um, and so this is a movie um, uh, of those uh, neurons uh, that connect the haltiers to the wing steering muscles. And uh, then, the wing steering muscles can adjust the wing motion. So that's uh, this beautiful video that came out of the group at Oxford, um, where you now have a view into the fly as it's flapping. The, the warm colored muscles are the ones that are driving the wing stroke. And then the cooler muscles here are four out of the 12 steering muscles that actually affect slight motions of the wing as this insect is flying and trying to stabilize itself. And what I would like to do next is tell you about um, how we're trying to understand uh, the way that uh, these corrective maneuvers are implemented at the neuromuscular scale. And in order to do this, we're gonna use some genetic engineering 
and try to interrogate the circuits that are responsible for these uh, slight perturbations, uh, corrections. And this is really uh, work that was started in my lab by Sam Whitehead. And everything that I'm gonna show you here is uh, completely due to his uh, amazing efforts and the fantastic collaborations that he's been able to spawn. So in this particular case, we're working with folks from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and from Caltech. Uh, this is uh, David Stern and Michael Dickinson's lab. Uh, David is a, a world expert in the neuroscience of courtship behavior. Uh, Michael Dickinson is, uh, I'd call him the 800 pound gorilla in the fly world, except he's so nice that uh, uh, he's the 800 pound nice person in the fly world, just an amazing individual and a true inspiration. And again, we were able, lucky enough to work with them. And in order to um, uh, test things out, what we wanted to do is we wanted to start futzing around with these steering muscles to see um, what their effects are on these uh, perturbative maneuvers. What I'm gonna tell you about is something called the B1 or Basilar 1 muscle. It's this one right here. Um, so the B1 muscle, what's known? Well, first of all, it fires once per wing stroke. So it's called a tonic muscle. It fires every time the wing flaps. And what happens is that when the um, uh, uh, muscle fires uh, in coordination with the wing stroke, um, you get one stroke amplitude. When the muscle fires a little bit delayed, like you're seeing in these two black dots, then the wing goes further to the front, uh, as you can see here. And so there's good evidence that the B1 muscle is doing something to change that front sweeping angle uh, of, the, of the stroke. Um, uh, let's see, uh, the motor neuron for the B1 muscle, what's nice about flies is that they have these 12 steering muscles and each one is innervated by one neuron. And so that means that if you can just target that one motor neuron, you can affect the entire muscle. Um, so that motor neuron receives direct input from the halteres and wings. And so it's getting information from these sensory organs and uh, then applying it to the B1 uh, muscle. And there's also evidence in tethered animals that the B, the basilar muscles, are related to things that happen in pitch. And this is, again, work that came out of Michael's lab. And so what we wanted to figure out was whether or not we could start to manipulate this neuron and see if it affected flight, uh, free flight uh, as well in this, uh, in this manner. Okay, so again, this is the uh, B1 motor neuron. And what's amazing now as, is that with genetic engineering, we can target individual motor neurons in the fly ventral nervous cord. That's what you're seeing here. Um, and we can do things. So for example, we could just leave the motor neuron alone or we could manipulate it um, optogenetically and essentially put a little knob on it that allows us to dial its activity from uh, you know, very active to inactive. And so what do we see when, when we do that? Well, if I have a fly that's coming in, uh, it's been normal its whole life, and then all of a sudden we shine a green light on it. Um, in that particular case, what we find is that when the LED is on, the fly's pitch starts to go lower and lower. So if the pitch angle used to be around 45, now you can see the pitch is getting much lower. When we turn the LED off right around here, the pitch recovers. And if we plot a, a controller uh, model, what we find is that um, in this particular case, the integral gain for the controller has uh, gone away. Okay, it's, uh, whereas the proportional gain and the time delay look like they're relatively unaffected. If we do the opposite, if we now activate the B1 motor neuron, and that in turn activates the B1 muscle, um, we get this movie. So this is a movie of a fly, normal its whole life. All of a sudden, we shine red light on it and we uh, activate the muscle. That ends up apparently causing the wings to go so far to the front that the fly actually ends up doing a backflip in midair, right? So this is, uh, in, I think it's in fact two backflips in, in midair by the time, or by the time uh, this is done for some of the movies that we've seen. Okay, so again, the idea is that you're activating something that's giving you a pitch uh, of the fly. Um, you can quantify this data, so not just two movies, but do it for many, many flies. And what you see is that uh, when we inactivate the muscle, 
um, what you get is a reduction in the pitch. Not much happens to roll. Not much happens to the yaw. If you activate it, the pitch goes up. And again, not much happens to roll or yaw. And like we expect, when you activate the wing uh, stroke uh, shrinks a little bit. When you, uh, when you deactivate, it shrinks a little bit. When you activate, it increases a little bit uh, as, as we expect. So what about control? How does this all work in the context of these perturbation experiments that I was showing you? And so if we take a look at a movie of a normal fly, um, we see just everything as before. The, the pitch perturbation is applied. The fly flaps uh, less in the front to get it back to normal. And if we uh, fit this data with a PI controller, um, we uh, do just fine at predicting this uh, forward sweep angle of the wing. Now, if we do this with a silenced fly, what we find is that the pitch of the fly initially is actually uh, wobbly. And then when we apply the perturbation, we find that it is able to stabilize or sort of wobble itself to a new set point, but it's completely lost any information about where it came from. from. And we can still fit a controller to this uh, wing stroke, but this time it's only a proportional controller. It's as though we've turned off the integral part, which tells the fly the total angular displacement, which is why it can't find where it came from again. It has to stabilize in, around a new angle. You can quantify this data Again, by heroically doing this for many, many flies. Um, and what we find is that, as we uh, showed in the movies, the integral gain is substantially different um, when you look at the uh, silenced neuron as compared to the normal flies. And the proportional gain uh, looks unaffected, and the time delay looks unaffected for these flies. And it doesn't really matter if you uh, roll left, or, or pitch, pitch up, pitch down, uh, they basically have the same types of behaviors. So when we take out this motor uh, neuron, we essentially kill this integral part of the uh, control uh, diagram. All right, well, what happens if we do another basilar muscle? So, so here's work that uh, I'm showing you now on the B2 muscle, another one in the Basler group. And again, what we find in this particular case is that the integral controller is just fine, but now the pitch gain is significantly lowered in the case where you silence the B2 motor neuron. And so in this particular case, what you do is you uh, unlock this part of the control circuit. And so what we've done is essentially figure out where in the fly these elemental control you know, bits are. And that gives us um, a place where we can start pulling the thread and looking at the complete control circuit as we trace it back from these motor neurons all the way back to the hall tiers where the uh, sensory signals were coming from. Okay, um, if I take a look at roll control while I'm uh, uh, silencing either the B1 or the B2 uh, muscles, I get no uh, change in the integral, proportional, or time delay uh, parameters for the roll perturbations. So in other words, silencing the B1 and B2 seems to leave roll unaffected. And that gives us the hypothesis. Um, so this is for B1, and here's the data for B2. Same, same thing, you don't get any effect. And that gives you the hypothesis that really you have a separate PI controller for each degree of freedom, and maybe they act in parallel to one another. So the idea is that you, you don't have everything sort of going through one circuit that then affects uh, the other ones. You have parallel channels for these controllers that allow you to have very rapid response, and they do it in a way that uh, completely doesn't affect, one doesn't affect the other. At least that's the conjecture that we currently have, and we're working very hard to test that conjecture and see uh, if it uh, um, gives us, uh, if we're able to prove it one way or the other. Um, so is it just that simple? Is it just uh, three PI controllers, uh, parallel circuits, 
Um, well, we know that it can't be just that simple. Um, so for example, in this particular case, we have a fly with a magnet on its back. And what we do is we take the field and we start switching it. So this is, I think, the first ever quadruple pendicular quad helix with a twist that a fly has ever done. And what you'll notice is that when we shut the magnets off after one, two, three or so wing beats, the fly is able to recover. And what's amazing about that is that the fly didn't roll back eight times. If this was really a linear controller, then if you roll it forward eight times, you'd expect that it'd go back eight times. And so somehow the fly has a mod function on the circuit. And that's really where I think a lot of the interesting part of the neuroscience comes in, because now you could think about all these middle neurons, what we call interneurons, that could affect the signals coming in from the whole tiers and do some calculations like a mod function. If you have a different sensor that tells you where the horizontal is, you could cut off the response from going backwards eight times. Or what happens if your wing gets clipped and now you have to modify the, uh, the coefficients just for the right wing and not for the left? Which neurons are telling the uh, sensory circuit and uh, PI circuit to change their gains a little bit in order to accommodate something like that? So in order to go after that kind of problem, we really need to do a full-blown uh, uh, investigation of the ventral nervous cord circuits. And so to do that, uh, we collaborated with uh, a group at the HHMI. Again, same players, Dickinson, uh, David Stern, but now really led by Gwyneth Card and her postdoc, uh, Erica. And the idea here uh, through this visiting project was to develop uh, as many lines as we could that allowed us to target neurons in the ventral nervous cord of the fly. And so that's what we did. Uh, these are some of the uh, 200 or so uh, uh, clean lines that we were able to get out. So each one of these is essentially a line where we can activate or deactivate individual neurons or sometimes small number like two or three neurons in the ventral nervous cord. And now we can go to town trying to figure out what each of these neurons does how it uh, connects to the B1, B2, or some of the other uh, um, motor neurons, et cetera. So let me just show you some of the very quick results uh, that we're getting. I won't go into detail on these because I know uh, I need to finish up. So this is the turgopleural muscle, one of the 12 steering muscles that wasn't thought to be important for flight, but it looks like it changes the pitch of the fly. So if you look at the fly's pitch, it actually goes up when we uh, activate these muscles. Um, this is the I1 and the I2 muscles. And if I play the videos, what you'll see is that when we activate the flies, um, look what happens to its wing stroke right around here. The wing stroke completely stops, right? So these uh, flies are now just floating downwards when we activate these I1. And when you uh, turn it off, they can flap again. And so the idea is to try to figure out if these are related to the roll control because they're so uh, important for the wing flapping amplitude. Um, the 3-1 uh, muscle here, uh, if I play this video, what you'll see is uh, that this muscle, uh, sorry, I'm playing these two as well, but let's just focus on the bottom one. If you activate it, uh, what you end up getting is a rolling fly. So it's easiest to see over here that the fly is rolled when you activate the 3-1 muscle, giving you an asymmetric response. And so again, the idea is that by going after these, you can try to trace back which PI controller they're attached to. And then by doing these experiments, not just with the uh, motor uh, neurons, but also the interneurons, trace it back to the hall tiers and really figure out how these insects are controlling their flight through these optogenetic stimulation, suppression, and magnetic field experiments. Okay, so in the one last minute, um, I just want to uh, address uh, uh, the fact that these are the folks who are, who are doing these experiments. Um, uh, Sam, again, the person who really uh, instituted everything in our lab, but then has taught all these fantastic grad students and undergrads uh, how to do these experiments. Okay, so in the last minute, I just want to ask the question, is this machinery necessary? What happens if you disable the whole tiers? So in this experiment, what Life did way back then was he glued the hall tiers to the body of the fly. 
And what he showed was that when you do that, the flies can no longer control their flight. And that's because flapping flight is unstable to these aerodynamic instabilities that essentially end up forking uh, the fly. But you can rescue this uh, uh, by essentially doing the control theory and the uh, stability analysis. And if you can put some dampener on the fly, then you can set the time scale at which the fly is able to recover to be much longer. Once you do that, other sensory organs in the fly can take over. And in fact, you can do this experiment by taking some strands of um, dandelion seeds, gluing them to the butt of the fly, and then the fly, even though its haltiers are glued down, can recover just fine. And in fact, uh, there are animals that use this strategy. This is the fuzzle butt. Um, it's uh, a, a little insect that you can find here in Ithaca. It has lots of these strands coming out. It doesn't need haltiers in order to stabilize its flight. Um, but then the question is, why do we need haltiers at all? And the answer is that in the same way that an airliner jet is stable, but not very maneuverable, the ability to generate these haltiers and essentially use them to control flight allows you to become much more maneuverable and allows you to then hunt these more um, less agile uh, prey and also avoid predation. And so there's a real evolutionary pressure towards developing these fast neural controllers in the fly. And that's part of why we're so interested in this neural circuit in the fly, this very small animal that can do these perturbations so quickly, um, you can really uh, test the bare bone circuit and then try to see how it extends to more complex organisms. So with that, let me just uh, put up this picture again and, and ask the question again. This, this is Drosophila melanogaster. Isn't he beautiful? Thank you. Thank you, Itai, for a very nice talk. So we are going a little over time. So what I will, I will do is I will ask you one question from chat, and then we will take more questions on this part of the talk, you know, at the end of both talks, right? So the question I want to ask uh, is Shiram's question, and I will combine Wallace's comment with it. So Shiram's question is, how long does a headless fly fly? What coordinates its motion without a brain? And Wallace's comment was, like, is the headless fly, uh, can it still do roll correction? Yes, yeah, so the answer is it can still do roll correction. Uh, how long? It depends on how well you cauterize it because uh, it evaporates, the hemolymph evaporates, and then uh, the fly desiccates and all of the bad things happen. Um, flies can do an amazing amount of things uh, without a head. They can groom, uh, they can fly, they can walk. Uh, so a lot of these, um, are what's known as reflexive actions, they can do without a head. In terms of trajectory, you know, uh, at some point it's going to, you know, lose its way or bump into a, a surface and not know what to do. So it's not like the, the head is not needed at all. But in order to do flight, a lot of the flight apparatus has really just been concentrated at the ventral nervous cord, probably to make it a much faster response time so you don't have to go through the 50 milliseconds that it would take to compute a response in the brain and then send it back to the wing neural muscles. Here you can get a response in five milliseconds, one of the fastest responses in the animal kingdom. Certainly one of the fastest neural responses uh, that isn't just purely mechanical in the animal kingdom. Really amazing uh, feat. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, seems to me like I should uh, start my tutorial you should start your tutorial. And I guess I had a quick announcement is that for this part, I would request the PhD students and the postdocs to turn on your video if you're know if you okay with that, if you're comfortable with that. Yes, and I'm uh, happy again to take uh, clarative questions. Mm -hmm. and so uh, I don't know if you guys remember this. Uh, I was raised in the 80s and in the 80s, uh, this was all the rage for, um, physicists and flies. This, this is, of course, uh, uh, you know, from the movie The Fly with uh, Jeff Goldblum. And uh, um, I put this picture up because I know that as physicists, we're often uh, very loath to get into uh, things like uh, animals. Uh, of course, you know, this is a perfect example of that. It, it didn't end up uh, very well for Brendel Fly, uh, 
uh, you know, at the end of this movie. And so uh, it, it's with great caution uh, that someone like me, who had never really uh, worked with animals uh, before, uh, tried to get into this field of insect flight. Um, and I'd like to share with you some of my experiences. And really, a lot of this is going to be driven by uh, the things that were developed by Sam Whitehead and uh, Yunus Kinkabwala in my lab. And so uh, to them really goes most of the credit for, for the developments that, that we've had. Okay, so these slides are um, essentially going to give you a little overview of the fly as a model system, but it's for non-experts. Uh, I've collected a few online resources that you'll be able to go back to in the recorded video and, uh, and, and tap. And, and those are really the the ones you should read to figure out how to get up and running. But I want to give you a little bit of the basics here. I will not go into the molecular biology um, and I will uh, uh, really just try to give you a, a top-down picture um, of, of what this is like uh, a fly lab in the, physics, uh, in the physics building. Okay, so why Drosophila? Well, when I first started my uh, investigations, I actually started with a little crustacean called a, uh, I don't even remember what it was called, but it was something that you had to dig out of the ocean and we could only get it, uh, you know, in the summer, ostracods, that's what they were. You could only get the ostracods in the summer and, you know, they were amazing little creatures. They swam like this, but the problem is we just couldn't get enough experiments done. Now Drosophila, they've been developed in labs for a reason. They're super easy to work with. They're easy to handle. They have a short generation time. They have stereotype behaviors, some of which we'll talk about. Um, there's a dozen, dozens of analysis tools that have now been developed for Drosophila. There's a lot, a huge collection of stable lines of mutants, um, access to powerful genetic techniques, um, especially the libraries now developed by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And the infrastructure to, to obtain the, the flies and materials is already set up for you. And so once we started working with flies, we understood why everyone loves these animals. They're super easy to work with. Um, there's, very, there's no IRB protocols because they don't have a spine. So you can get started right away. I'm not condoning that you should do bad things to them, but I'm just saying that the hurdles are, are low for getting involved in this kind of research. This is kind of the life cycle of the fly. Um, uh, you basically have an embryo that goes into first, second, and third instar. It has a pre-pupa stage, a pupal stage, and then it hatches and is ready to go. And all of this happens uh, you know, relatively fast. The genome of the fly is actually 60% homologous to humans, which means that you can actually study diseases that show up in humans in a fly. Um, and that uh, is nice because again, like I said, the fly is often a much simpler version of more complicated higher animals. And so if you can figure out um, what's going on in the fly, oftentimes it becomes a good working hypothesis for people working in mice and, and higher organisms like, uh, like primates. Okay, so some fly basics. Um, the larvae grow in vials. So the lab, at least one of the lab uh, rooms is full of vials like these where the flies are um, eating this cornmeal, this mush. Uh, they climb up the walls and they eclose. I'm not sure if I have any eclosers here. Um, and uh, they eclose about after two weeks. Uh, the adults are, are transferred. Uh, you essentially uh, flip a vial uh, to new food um, and uh, you can anesthetize them with cold or CO2. Um, and then that allows you to uh, sort them under the microscope, males, females, uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, offsprings uh, using a little simple paintbrush or a little pooter tube that you have that can allow you to pick them up and place them in the different vials. Um, uh, they can be bred uh, by separating the males and the females sh shortly after they eat close and you collect the female virgins. Um, the equipment that you need is really cheap. So to get started with uh, a fly experiment, uh, you, you need something like this. Uh, it costs you about 300 bucks. If you want fluorescence to go with it and dissection, you might have to pay a couple thousand for that. Uh, you have a little uh, incubator, that's a couple thousand, a few thousand. Um, if you want to do fly uh, flight experiments, free flight experiments, then you might need to construct 
uh, an apparatus or buy a few of these phantom cameras. Um, these cameras have become much cheaper. And with flies, you only need about 10,000 frames per second. So you're not really pushing these to the edge. So you can do this for uh, about $30,000. You can get a full setup. Um, let's see. Uh, then you got to learn a little bit about breeding. Um, so this is uh, some of what we do in our lab. Um, breeding is uh, very well developed in flies. They have a short generation time of about two weeks, like I said. And uh, sample handling, simple handling is, has led to extensive libraries. So um, a classic experiment was to put these flies uh, in a dark light, uh, so half dark, half light environment. Um, you just wait for the flies that naturally go to the dark uh, to, to come over here. You look for the flies that naturally go to the light. You go over here, you separate them, you keep breeding them. And after a few generations, you can get flies that naturally move towards the light and other ones that avoid light. Um, so originally, mutant lines were found by experiments like these and by mutating uh, uh, through radiation and chemicals. Uh, but nowadays, we have ways of introducing viruses and genetically manipulating them that are much easier. So um, uh, this is a mutant fly from uh, Mothra and Godzilla days. Um, but the idea is that through these more modern techniques, uh, we can generate not just uh, uh, fun, fun movies, but also flies that can uh, really have big behavioral differences. So there's cheap date. Uh, this uh, fly has uh, a change in its sensitivity to alcohol. Uh, it's used to study uh, addiction. Um, we have fruitless, which exhibits uh, mating behavior uh, with the opposite sex. Uh, we have uh, a fly line called amnesiac, which reduces the ability uh, to make memories. Um, we have a clock fly, which has different circadian cycles. And you can imagine how useful these lines are for studying fly behavior in all sorts of different contexts. Um, it's really, really amazing. Uh, and, and this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Now, most of the modern uh, breeding happens using, using systems like uh, the GAL4 UAS system. And again, I'm not going to go through this in extraordinary detail, just to say that by um, having a protein that essentially um, is, uh, when you combine the GAL4 and the UAS system together, that protein uh, codes for ion channels that are light sensitive in a neuron. And so by shining light on that neuron, you can open the pore and essentially depolarize or activate or deactivate the neuron. Now, by separating the GAL4 from the UAS system, you essentially allow yourself to make genetic mutants with the GAL4 system, make ones with the UAS system, and by breeding them, you can get crosses that have only rarely both of the components in the same neuron. And that's how you're able to really screen out the lines and create very, very targeted mutants which allows to manipulate very specific uh, neurons uh, just one at a time. Uh, there are other systems like the LexA, LexAop, uh, Q systems. A bunch of these are coming online. Um, they're really powerful uh, genetic tools for doing the kinds of perturbation experiments that I showed you in the previous talk. Um, you could uh, have the UAS genes uh, code for fluorescence. So you can take a fly. This is what it looks like in bright field, but you could just as easily make it fluorescent. Now you can keep track of the flies that have a particular uh, genetic mutation. Um, you can cross those genes with other uh, 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 GAL4 uh, uh, mutants that will allow you to fluoresce individual components of the um, fly in different stages of development. Um, you can take the genes and you can uh, make the flies essentially sensitive, if you can target the genes for smelling carbon dioxide, then by shining light on a fly, you can essentially get them to think that they're smelling carbon dioxide. And that makes them move away from the light. So these mutants here, uh, in this video, where you have red here, you're shining light on them, and you can see they move away from the red zones. When I switch the light, all of a sudden, uh, what used to be black is now red. Now they move into the black zones. And you can see their density changes. When you do this with wild types, nothing much happens. And so these flies essentially flee 
from red light because they smell carbon dioxide or they think they're smelling carbon dioxide. And we're using these flies to do population dynamics where you put flies that can smell or see the red light and smell carbon dioxide on one side of the room and then run to the other side and maybe vice versa to see how crowds react when they uh, go past each other at a mosh pit or something like that. Um, again, uh, there's a lot that you can do with these libraries once you develop them. So I want to give you just a few minutes of, of what we're doing with the library that we developed with this collaboration uh, in terms of testing hypotheses. So these again are some of the 200 lines that, that we uh, put together. And I want to show you how you might organize uh, these in order to generate hypotheses that you would then want to test in behavioral experiments. So for example, you could look at which neurons are just next to each other and you can try to cluster them. And so for example, um, this cluster has a bunch of neurons um, and this one in particular, the VUMI has projections. In other words, it, it connects all of these different uh, parts. It connects the neck neurons, the wing neurons, the haltiers, the tectulum. Uh, it connects the AMN, which I have my little cheat sheet here, is the uh, accessory mesothoracic neuropill. It connects the uh, MVAC, which uh, I don't think I even put that on here. Okay, I, didn't, uh, I don't have my cheat sheet. But the idea then is that uh, you can look at the fly anatomy and actually look at what these different sections are. So like MVAC, is this brown part over here, and AMN is this part over here. It's at the bottom of the fly. It's near where the legs are. And this then connects to the neck and the haltier and the wing motor neurons. And so this kind of cluster suggests that it's responsible for like a takeoff behavior where you're essentially uh, kicking the legs and then flapping and adjusting your, uh, your sensory apparatus to allow you to take off in a particular direction in a stable manner. And so you can do this kind of clustering all over uh, the flies. And then you can ask, um, how are these little clusters connected to the descending neurons coming from the head? So in this particular case, this is a neuron called DNPO6, doesn't really matter. It's a sister to the giant fiber. And it comes down from the head and it connects to cluster number nine pretty strongly. So that's this connection over here. And cluster number nine has a lot of neurons that connect between the legs and the neck and the wing and the haltiers, just like I talked about before. And so this suggests that this is a very controlled takeoff mode that allows you to kick your legs in a controlled fashion, start beating your wings and uh, adjust your head motions and connect with the haltiers to essentially guide the, uh, the takeoff behavior. If I look at this cluster though, cluster number 10, which is uh, connected to the giant fiber, DP01, uh, what you see is that it has very few connections. It, it just looks at the leg and then the wing and the tectulum. It bypasses the haltiers. It doesn't care about the head. This is basically a get the heck out of there uh, uh, circuit which essentially just means jump the heck out of the way and start, and start flapping. I don't care what the heck's going on. And so this is the way that you can start taking these libraries and forming hypotheses with them, which you can then start testing in behavioral experiments. And it's a very powerful way for starting to uh, make progress on these ventral nervous cord um, neurons. There is an entire library of such flies in the Bloomington uh, Drosophila Stock Center. You just uh, call them up, order the flies that you want uh, with the behaviors that you want. They ship them out to you, most likely on your campus. There is a fly group that is willing to help you get started. And you can start doing experiments with these, with undergrads uh, even um, really quickly and seeing some beautiful behaviors. And since there's so much to investigate, um, it's likely that there's a lot that um, still needs to be learned. Let me show you some of the beautiful fly behaviors that people have been going after. And this is a very small subset of, of what uh, people have done. Uh, people have looked a lot at courtship and mating. Uh, it turns out that fly courtship and mating is very stereotyped. Uh, it starts uh, by tapping um, uh, a female uh, and then scissoring. Uh, that leads to some 
mid-leg swinging uh, behavior, uh, a little proboscis extension, uh, what's known as a nuptial gift, which I think is a little bit of um, uh, throw up material that uh, the male gives to the female to kind of pre-digest it. Here you go, you don't have to digest this anymore. It's ready for you to swallow gift. Uh, you get wing extension and then uh, attempted copulation. Um, so all of these steps, um, there are now mutants uh, that allow you to target the different steps in these. And you can imagine the cascade of neural circuits that needs to be activated in order to do each one of these behaviors. Proboscis extension is a whole neural circuit just for the extension and control of that proboscis. And so figuring out how you cascade from one to another is just amazing. There's a lot of work that's um, been done on foraging, just watching what flies do in new environments. So there are different uh, uh, personality types. There are flies that just like to sit around. Um, and so if they're fed, they might explore a little bit of their environment, but not very much. Whereas this rover type fly um, will go uh, a much larger distance. And that uh, uh, also changes dramatically depending on how many uh, hours it's been since they've been fed. Um, there are flies that uh, exhibit very aggressive behavior. Uh, this is a slow motion video, had a lot of attention in nature of one fly attacking uh, another fly. And uh, in case you're, you're worried about that one, don't worry. Uh, he gets uh, his little uh, front legs up and, and starts skewering the other one. I mean, this is uh, reminiscent of the debate that we had recently. And so you can imagine how studying these flies could give us insight into the political theater that is uh, uh, happening uh, these days. Um, flight, which is my favorite uh, behavior. Uh, this is the movie that I showed you before where we now have mutants where we can shine light on them and, and get them to do little backflips. But just flight on itself is so spectacular to watch as these insects perform these figure eight wing strokes back and forth um, uh, through the air uh, as they move forward. Or in this particular case, uh, this insect had its wing half cut off. And you can see that it's doing just fine flying and maneuvering. How do insects learn how to fly in these different behaviors? Again, a fantastic uh, behavior to, to explore and investigate. Um, and so in all of these uh, uh, cases, uh, this is uh, where you would want to start using the, the fast kind of cameras. Um, and now we're getting into looking at groups of flies and crowds behaviors as these flies uh, congregate uh, in different arenas. Um, there are a ton of experimental tools. I see my time is running out, so I'm gonna briefly go through these. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, micro CT from the Wolfner lab showing the details of what happens during population. Um, this is a video showing uh, a CT uh, movie of a fly. Again, the kinds of details that you can now get are stunning, just absolutely spectacular. Of the muscle structure and the digestive system, the reproductive system, uh, the brain. Uh, it really is unbelievable uh, how much we can see inside. There are uh, experiments where you can tether a fly, uh, watch it from above, sometime even con sometimes even connect little probes and watch it as it walks. Um, there are experiments to track the fly legs uh, in arenas. There are experiments that do this automatically by essentially using machine learning techniques to back out these uh, types of coordinates. This is a beautiful way of also segmenting the behaviors. So you watch a fly and instead of having a graduate student or undergrad catalog, oh, now they're eating, now they're foraging, now they're grooming, you have computer techniques that can learn how to recognize these behaviors and start to see the map of behaviors and how they transition from one behavior to another. And of course, beautiful experiments for watching uh, these flies as they fly either in a tethered or uh, free prep um, and then see how they behave uh, um, as they are perturbed or genetically manipulated. And finally, um, we now, thanks to the folks at Genalia, have a complete electro um, EM uh, reconstruction of the entire brain and ventral nervous cord of the fly. And so within a year or two, we will know all of the connections 
between all of the neurons in the fly. It's been a massive undertaking and a real coup for the folks at the HHMI. And now we can do those tracing experiments following neurons from uh, a sensory apparatus all the way to um, the actual musculature. So with that, I'll leave you with some of the resources and I'll end there and take any uh, questions that you might have. Thank you, Itai, for a great tutorial. So I will ask you two questions from the chat and then we will go over, you know, we will start the 15 minute discussion where we go over questions from both talks. So this question is from Ashok Prasad and he asks, uh, do we understand at all how the neurons do the calculations? Um, th there are lots of cases where, um, uh, um, for example, there are neural circuits that have been figured out for how to do integration. Um, the thing that's problematic is that uh, those circuits are relatively slow. And so the question in this particular case of doing the integral, the proportional part, I think, people think comes directly from the haltier displacement. The question is how do you do the integral part? And you could do it in a number of ways. You could have a crappy um, low pass filter, which would uh, essentially give you integration. Another possibility is that there's a piece of the haltier that if you took um, sensory information from the haltier as it deformed, uh, maybe one of the surfaces on the haltier is actually giving you the integral part is acting like a crappy integrator. And that would be enough to just take neurons from there and pipe them directly into the motor neuron and the muscle. So we don't know how it's being done in the ventral nervous cord of the fly, um, but there are certainly circuits that have been figured out in other animals for integration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the next question is from Dylan Steer, and he asks, do some of these cluster connections break when decapitated? Uh, beyond the head ones, example, for example, if a cluster has a wing, leg, and head clustered connection, does that connection hold once decapitated, or is that known? I don't know what, uh, so how should I say it? The, the clustering that we did was on the neural architecture. So um, the, the question that I think you're asking is, in a live fly, or a fly that's been decapitated, would that neural circuit still be functioning? And the answer is that we haven't even determined whether that neural circuit is functioning in an undecapitated fly. So that's the first thing that we got to do. The, the measurement and mapping out of the neurons and which neurons are close enough that we think they're connected to form a cluster, you still got to do the hard neuroscience to prove that those neurons are indeed connected to each other, that that circuit is indeed functioning the way we think it should. And that takes a lot of hard neuroscience. What I showed in the clustering is a way of forming hypotheses that we then need to test. Once we show that that circuit uh, is functioning the way that we think it does, then comes your question of what happens when we decapitate. And there the issue is that if you don't get the signal from the descending neuron, it's hard to see how to activate that circuit. So you could go in directly with a probe or you could go in with an electrode and try to stimulate that circuit and trigger it. But um, you know, if you permanently damage the descending neuron so that it can't fire, then it may, you may have disabled that, uh, that um, program. That doesn't mean that you can't activate it in some other way, but we really need to do the hard neuroscience of working through those hypotheses, working through that neuroscience, and that's kind of uh, the work that the people in the field are doing. All right. Thank you, Itai. So now we are going to go back to questions on, we will, uh, yeah, Dylan says thanks. So we 